So here's why I find the GTX 1660 Ti a really interesting product and why its performance is something of a landmark. Let's go back to March 17th, 2015. Nvidia introduces its new GPU king, the $1,000 Titan X, based on its Maxwell architecture. It's using a big chip 28 nanometer design with a 250 watt TDP and it's a beast. And it was followed up four months later by the GTX 980 Ti, which offers equivalent performance with a price cut. Nvidia had established a new performance tier, one that it stuck to with Pascal with the GTX 1070, a $350 price point here offering a touch more performance than a card that had cost a cool thousand just over a year previously. With the arrival of the Turing-based 1660 Ti, that performance tier resurfaces again at just over a quarter of its original cost. But actually, when I say performance is the same, what I actually mean to say is that in many cases, it's actually faster, significantly so in a fair few cases. GTX 1660 Ti is also fascinating in that, although based on Nvidia's new Turing architecture, it's not actually capable of ray tracing as its technical makeup includes no RT cores. Neither were there tensor cores, meaning that deep learning functions such as DLSS, not available. What you do get, however, is Turing's new shader core and a few other interesting trimmings that are part and parcel of the design, such as adaptive shading, mesh shaders, and other more future looking features. So the 1660 Ti is a value orientated card priced at $280 and it's technically a replacement for the immensely successful GTX 1060. That launched at $250 so there has been another price rise here. However, performance is indeed 1070 level by and large. Sometimes better, sometimes worse. But in keeping with the value theme, we're looking at the PNY XLR8 version here, which I rather like for a couple of reasons. First of all, it was delivered bang on MSRP. The cooler is a tiny bit too loud, but likely to be muffled by your case, but it does overclock just fine. Temperatures are manageable and uh, look at the size of it. GTX 1070 level performance in a basic version of the card with a very small form factor and no price premium? That can't be bad. IO wise, we're looking at a fairly basic setup here. We've got HDMI 2.0, a single display port and dual link DVI. A limited array of ports then, no USB-C virtual link, but I think overall it's just fine for the vast majority of this card's use case scenarios. Power input, pretty much unchanged from the GTX 1070, so we're looking at a single eight pin socket there. Though TDP is lower at just 120 watts, that's less than half of the Titan X Maxwell and GTX 980 Ti, by the way. At the board level, Nvidia deploys another new processor here. We're not looking at a cutback RTX 2060 based on TU-106, but rather a fully enabled TU-116. And here's how the specs line up between 1060 and 1070, the cards that the 1660 Ti effectively replaces, and the RTX 2060, the next most powerful Turing offering. CUDA core counts between Pascal and Turing aren't really so relevant. The new architecture gets a whole lot more done with fewer cores, but you can see that the 1660 Ti has 80% of the 2060's core count and about 86% of its memory bandwidth. With that in mind then, you should expect to see some pretty close benchmarks then. Since this review is a little late, I decided to put a bit of a spin on it. First of all then, yes, of course, I'll be benchmarking the product and trying to figure out how it stacks up against its Pascal counterparts and of course the RTX 2060. And yeah, some AMD competitors too. 590 Vega 56. We'll take a look at those too, but we're also going to be doing something different. I talked in prior RTX videos about how GPUs are getting so powerful, your CPU may not be capable of extracting its full performance. So I'm going to take some of the most recent challenging games and I'll be trying to run them at 1080p60 locked with the 1660 Ti paired with the i5-8400 a CPU that most agree is pretty good in terms of price versus performance. First of all though, benchmarks, Wolfenstein 2 The New Colossus. It's a game that absolutely loves Turing architecture for starters, and on top of that, it supports the new adaptive shading technology. Well, to begin with, I'm benching the game in our New Orleans test run with this feature disabled for generational comparisons. Interesting stuff here. 
GTX 1660 Ti delivers a massive 27% boost to performance over GTX 1070, rising to 74% over the 1060. I mean, that's pretty amazing, right? In this scenario, the 1660 Ti offers around 92% of the performance of the RTX 2060. The one caveat being frame time stutter I didn't pick up on with the other cards. But in addition to this out of the box improvement, Turing's adaptive shading works on this card too. I extended the test run here and ran the game with balanced adaptive shading and the performance option and I stacked it up against the game running with it disabled. Now here's the thing, this technology works essentially by lowering quality in areas where you're not likely to really notice it. In motion and in darker scenes, for example. At 1080p running in the balanced mode, we get an extra 9% of extra performance, rising to 11% in the performance mode. But that is an average. Some scenarios, some scenes that we render here, offer more savings while others deliver fewer. The bottom line though, Adaptive shading isn't slower in any scenario, so you know, it's a win. I also reran the same test at 1440p resolution. There's an extra 10% of performance here overall from balanced and 13% from the performance mode. In theory, the adaptive shading algorithm should be able to make more efficiency savings at higher resolutions, but there's not a revelatory improvement on this case. One thing to point out, of course, is that Wolfenstein doesn't actually have its own benchmark. We're using a run through a later stage here, but obviously there will be some variance from one run to the next. Bottom line though, adaptive shading works and I hope to see it running in future titles where the performance uplift could be more significant. Let's look at more traditional performance then, targeting the 1660 Ti's 1080p resolution. It's kind of sweet spot. Going to start with Far Cry 5. GTX 1070 and 1660 Ti effectively jostle for leadership throughout the benchmark, with the Pascal card moving slightly ahead, while RTX 2060 delivers a 14 point lead over its less capable cousin. GTX 1060 is left for dust. 1660 Ti is 37% faster. And there's a similar story here in Assassin's Creed Odyssey, a massively challenging workout for both CPU and GPU, with both 1660 Ti and 1070 effectively matched point for point across the benchmark. Interestingly, the 2060 only offers a 9% advantage here at 1080p, but again, there's a big 34 point lead over GTX 1060. Okay, so this is a game where just a settings tweak or two can vastly increase performance. I'm gonna to return to this one later for some actual gameplay testing. Let's take a look at some legacy titles next and a return to my old favorite Assassin's Creed Unity. Turing is designed very much with modern game engine design in mind. And you may find that performance suffers a touch, just a touch when running older games. AC Unity shows that here, lagging behind the GTX 1070 by a couple of points, though there's still a 35% lead over the old 1060. RTX 2060 is 16% faster. So overall then, it's not bad, but losing pace just a touch against Pascal. And it's the same story in Crisis 3, though somewhat amplified. Here, across the whole run, the GTX 1070 actually delivers a 7% advantage over the 1660 Ti, the new card's performance advantage whittled away to 30% over the classic 1060. Yes, that's nowhere near as good as some of the other games we're gonna be testing, but it's still a healthy chunk of extra power. Relatively though, RTX 2060 fares pretty well here. It's 19% to the better compared to the new card. A look at the two most recent Tomb Raider games next. And this also highlights patterns we've seen in prior during RTX reviews. There's a similar two point deficit here for the 1660 Ti compared to the 1070, while the 2060 is only 16 points ahead. Something quite interesting here though, the bench takes place over three different sections. In the first section, 1070 is only about two frames per second ahead of the 1660 Ti, but the gap widens in the second segment set within the Prophet's Tomb, where the gap starts off at four frames per second, but gradually narrows and equalizes by the end. In the final section of the benchmark set in the geothermal valley, 1070 can be anything up to 10% faster. There's a similar situation in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, but this time the 1660 Ti scores better than the 1070, presumably owing to its newer iteration of the foundation engine. 
However, again in the first segment, 1660Ti and 1070 are effectively on par, while strange things are afoot in the second segment. 1070 loses pace, but 1660Ti and 2060 can barely be separated. The third and longest test area, right at the end, sees the 2060 scream ahead, while the 1070 is only a touch slower than the 1660Ti. So we're going to end our standard benches here with the Punishing Ghost Recon Wildlands Ultra Level Workout. It's a bit of an anti-climax, but it kind of sums up the card as a whole. And we're back to the default state of affairs with 1660Ti matching the 1070 point for point. So we've not really mentioned AMD's offerings at this point. RX 590 came out fairly recently and it's essentially an overclocked 580, which is in turn an overclocked 480. Then there's the much more interesting Vega 56, the card that proved competitive enough for Nvidia to magic up a 1070 Ti to keep it at bay. Pricing is interesting here as the 1660 Ti is effectively at a midpoint between the 590 and uh, the Vega 56. So how does it all shake out? Well, it depends on the title, of course. Assassin's Creed Odyssey, despite AMD branding, isn't really an AMD friendly game. The 1660 Ti is 39% faster than the 590, while Vega 56 only 2% to the better. The 1660 Ti needs tweaking to lock convincingly to 60 FPS in gameplay. But the bottom line here is that the new Nvidia card does operate in a kind of sweet spot. And the bench says that the 2060 at 1080p resolution is only 10% faster. AMD just isn't fast enough on this one. Compare and contrast with Battlefield 1, where Vega 56 has a useful chunk of extra performance, about 9% more and sits between 2060 and 1660 Ti. Now, the new Nvidia card commands a good 35 point lead over the RX 590, but to be fair, well, the AMD card there is about 40 to $50 cheaper. Vega 56 actually commands a decent enough lead over the RTX 2060 in Far Cry 5, though in simpler parts of the bench, the Nvidia card inches ahead. By extension then, the 1660 Ti suffers by comparison. Vega 56 is 14% faster. Maybe it's down to support for half rate floats, so-called rapid packed math, but the RX 590 actually doesn't have that and it's as close to 1660 Ti as it's ever going to get here. The new Nvidia card is just 18% faster. Shadow of the Tomb Raider's propensity for weirdness continues. Vega screams ahead in the first section of the benchmark and yeah, as you might suspect, it also scores highly in the third segment. Here, it's challenging with the 2060, though it's not quite close enough. However, in the second jungle section, 2060 and 1660 Ti both offer very, very similar performance an inch ahead of Vega. Kind of strange, this one. Bottom line though, at worst, the 1660 Ti is on par with 1070, and by extension, it's not too far behind Vega 56, while at the same time, it's a ton faster than the RX 590, the 580, and by extension, the 1060, the 980, whatever. But let's forget overclocked i7s and unlocked frame rates for a moment, and let's take a look at a more realistic gaming scenario. You buy a card like this for locked 1080p60 gameplay on the most taxing of settings, right? And you've seen the benches, you know it's a good performer for the money. But some titles aren't so easy to run at that locked 60, and sometimes it's down to the game being poorly optimised. Pretty classic example of that here, Anthem on ultra settings running with a Core i5-8400. VSync is on here, but 60fps locked is off the table, and something's not quite right here. I can dip beneath 40 frames per second, but I don't think it's the GPU's fault. You can see that utilisation here is as low as 66%, so a third of our GPU power isn't being deployed. Decreasing settings to high can help boost the lowest frame rates, but really the VSync implementation is balked here, and the 60fps threshold is best achieved by running in borderless mode, not full screen. Even then, this is a game I think needs to be run unlocked. By trying to lock to 60, the dips are just too hard. I eventually settled on a mixture of high and ultra settings and ran unlocked. And, uh, you know, it played fine, but really an adaptive sync display is required for this one. I also tried overclocking. The 1660 Ti is fine with a 125 MHz boost to the core and plus 700 on the G6 memory. Again, it helps with the frame rate lows here, as it will on all titles, I guess. 
Metro Exodus next. Not too much tweaking is required here because fundamentally you don't get a huge amount of stuff to tweak. It's perfectly fine just to run on high settings and keep physics and hair works off and your lock to 60 FPS is pretty much guaranteed even in the most challenging stage, which we're playing here. Also good is that a really important feature not available on console, tessellation, well you can enable that here and keep to the target. And uh, yeah, this greatly enriches the quality of the environments, which still look amazing at 1080p. It is a seriously beautiful game, and if you're not fussed about a lot 60, or if you own an adaptive sync display, letting frame rate wander above and below 60 allows you to enable more visual features. Yes, frame rates will dip, but thanks to adaptive screen technology, you won't really notice in the run of play. Bottom line though, a mainstream gaming PC using a 1660 Ti We'll do very, very well with this one. Finally, Assassin's Creed Odyssey. And this is an interesting title for sure, as it's one of the most demanding games of recent times, even running at 1080p resolution. Watch Alex's video on optimized settings for this one if you're playing it, as remarkably just reducing the quality of volumetric clouds and clouds only can increase performance by 31%. That's what I've done here, and running through the benchmark you can see that CPU utilization is very, very high. Yes, we're still above 60 frames per second, but we're running on a knife edge really, and there are scenarios in the game where CPU usage pushes higher, like the very beginning of the game in fact, where running so many NPCs in this environment can tap out fully an i5-8400. So can you be CPU bound with this capable processor paired with the 1660 Ti and running at 1080p? Well, yes you can. General gameplay though, you should be fine. But again, I think an adaptive sync display will really help with overall consistency here. So I'm going to wrap things up here. Is the 1660 Ti worth a look? Well, I'd definitely say it is. It's inevitably going to drive down prices on the 590 and hopefully Vega 56. The MSRP is $30 more than the 1060, but you're generally getting between 30 to 40% more performance. And that's seriously impressive stuff. Some of the scores have been perhaps too close to the RTX 2060, bearing in mind the $50 price gap. But given a choice, well, I'd save up more money for the 2060. I've run Battlefield 5 with the ray tracing at 1080p 60 locks, and I've got exceptionally close running Metro Exodus at the same settings as the 1660 Ti test I did previously, and I've done it with ray tracing enabled, and just the odd bit of frame loss. Personally, if I were buying a mainstream PC now, 2060 and an adaptive sync display would be the dream pairing, I think, at 1080p. A lot of you may well be considering upgrades from older GPUs like GTX 970, 960 or 760, and all of these cards were monstrous successes for Nvidia back in the day. So this benchmark uh, may be interesting. Yes, it's Crisis 3, a game where the 1660 Ti fell short compared to more modern titles. And it's a game that doesn't have any performance penalty for two gigabyte cards. But even in this worst case scenario, the 1660 Ti is 41% faster than 970, 120% faster than the 960. And in the final analysis, for many people looking to upgrade their older GPUs, those numbers will be the ones that matter. But that's all for me for now. You all know the score by now. Please like and subscribe, and of course, ring the bell for instant notifications whenever a new Digital Foundry video drops. Oh, and yes, you guys supporting the DF Patreon, we salute you. And well, YouTube encoders are really struggling right now to provide the higher quality versions of our content in a timely manner. So there's a huge quality boost for our Patreon users by grabbing our pristine downloadable videos, particularly when we post 4K content. Do please consider that if you'd like to help the team more directly. But in the meantime, that's all from me for now. Thanks for watching.